Scientific and Epidemic Intelligence that has been created here in Berlin, the WHO hub, it is three foci. It is better data, better analytics, and better decisions. And you will hear more about this and the intentions uh, during the session. But because uh, we need to connect to the world and we need to make sure that the many initiatives that are now being created as uh, we analyze what is it that we lack in terms of pandemic preparedness and response, we are delighted that other colleagues are joining us who are also building important initiatives. Our session will have uh, different phases. We will hear at first from important uh, uh, political actors uh, who are helping shape uh, the uh, ecosystem. We will then hear more about uh, the WHO hub, and then we will hear more about uh, the other initiatives and are able to discuss some general questions that are important. What we have said in terms of principles or dimensions or characteristics of such an ecosystem, uh, we understand now that it clearly needs to be multidisciplinary, that it needs to be multi-stakeholder, that we need to build a trust architecture around data, and that we need a distributed information exchange. Not everyone, everything is to be centralized in one place. So it's my great honor to lead you through this discussion and my particular pleasure to first ask the Director General of the World Health Organization, uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, to speak and uh, to give you an understanding what is the role of WHO in the center of such a uh, ecosystem and to explain why the world needs such an ecosystem at this point and how we can build it through which kind of political support. Please, Dr. Tedros, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lona. Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends, Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us uh, the world many uh, painful lessons. Uh, in my remarks last night, I outlined four areas in which I believe the global health architecture must be strengthened to prepare for, prevent, detect, and respond rapidly to outbreaks with epidemic and pandemic potential. One of those is the need for new powerful systems and tools for global surveillance to collect, analyze, and disseminate data on outbreaks with the potential to become epidemics and pandemics. Viruses move fast, but data can move even faster. With the right information, countries and communities can stay ahead of emerging risks and save lives. Urbanization, deforestation, climate change, and intensified agricultural practices are all increasing the risks of epidemics and pandemics, including those of zoonotic origin and antimicrobial resistance uh, pathogens. At the same time, new technologies are giving us the ability to predict, prevent, detect, and respond to outbreaks faster than ever before. Harnessing the power of these new technologies to save lives is not just an opportunity, it is an obligation. In October last year, Chancellor Angela Merkel and I first discussed the idea of a new platform to enhance global capacity for pandemic and epidemic intelligence. That's what the WHO hub for pandemic and epidemic intelligence is all about. Leveraging innovations in data science, harnessing the power of artificial intelligence, 
quantum computing and other cutting edge technologies and fostering greater sharing of data and information between communities and countries. No single institution or nation can do this alone. That's why we have used the term collaborative intelligence to capture the essence of our collective mission. It's not a single centralized system, but a constantly evolving global network designed for a fast changing and unpredictable future. The WHO Hub will bring together scientists, innovators, policymakers, one health specialists, and civil society representatives from around the world to work across borders and disciplines, making collaborative intelligence a reality. The knowledge and insights developed through the WHO Hub are designed to be put to practical use on the ground all over the world to improve detection, risk assessment, forecasting, and speed up the use of expanded genomic sequencing and diagnostic efforts. The tools and capacities developed at the WHO Hub will be achieved through collaborations among public health practitioners working at the local level and connected at the regional and global levels. It's a mosaic approach, an epidemiological ecosystem. The old rigid siloed hierarchical approaches are no long longer sufficient or practical. It's time for public health to catch up with other fields of sciences like CERN's global network of supercomputers or the hyper local networks of hundreds of thousands of weather stations that contribute to a global commons. What we have started in Berlin is the first building block of a strategic effort to building country and workforce capabilities, expand training and support national public health institutions and emergency operation centers. In line with the recommendations of recent reviews of pandemic preparedness and response, this is part of WHO's commitment to keeping the world safer, to being the organization the world needs and to giving countries the information and tools they need to protect their people. No one has done more to make the vision of the WHO hub a reality than Chancellor Merkel. Under her leadership, Germany has become a leading advocate for global health. This far predated the current crisis. Going back to the 2007 G8 summit, which mobilized 60 billion US dollars for global health. When the COVID-19 pandemic struck, the German government moved quickly to expand its financial support for WHO, becoming our biggest donor, as I said yesterday, and, one, and was one of the first supporters of the access to COVID-19 tools accelerator so that we could get therapeutics, diagnostics, and vaccines to the countries that need them most. It's that kind of international solidarity and forward thinking that the WHO Hub represents, working with partners around the globe to bring new technology and methodologies to all countries in an equitable, collaborative fashion. You'll be hearing about all of this in much more detail from my brother, Dr. Chikwe Ikweazu, our new Assistant Director General for Emergency Health Intelligence, formerly head of Nigeria's Center for Disease Control. I'm glad also that the Honorable Minister of Nigeria is, is with us uh, today. Thank you, sir, for joining us. I cannot tell you how pleased and honored I am that Chikwe will be joining us and leading this visionary effort. Of course, the hub is 
a game changer and he knows he has big responsibility. And since we spoke about um, you know, him taking over this um, hub, uh, I could see how seriously he has taken it. And I would also use uh, this opportunity uh, to thank uh, Bernard Schwatlander, my former uh, chief of cabinet and my dear uh, brother uh, for uh, really uh, building the first uh, you know, blocks that are necessary uh, for, for this hub. We hope to hear from many of you and your colleagues. Um, please uh, spread the word. We're looking for committed and diverse researchers from around the world to come and join us on this journey. The Hub is founded on the belief that global problems require a collaborative response that connects local and global efforts. By working together, we can build a healthier, safer, and more sustainable world for all. And I would also like to share with you that this Hub will benefit if the pandemic, agri pandemic agreement or pandemic treaty becomes a reality. As you know, the pandemic treaty was first proposed by the president of the Euro European Council, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Charlie uh, Michel. And I think he will join us uh, today. Uh, and um, I'm glad that he's joining in this uh, uh, panel uh, because the, realizing the um, uh, pandemic treaty will be a good uh, uh, you know, uh, support uh, for, for the hub because many of the things we're saying uh, will get some obligations from, from countries uh, to contribute uh, to the hub. So once again, thank you so much, Ilona, for this opportunity. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros, for sharing that uh, vision with us and underlining the enormous importance of uh, the kind of work we are undertaking now and embarking on. We already heard on the one hand yesterday in the opening many of the initiatives that are underway in the European Union and in particular also at the European Commission. You, Dr. Tedros, have already introduced uh, Mr. Charles Michel, who is here with us live from Brussels. You've already indicated one of the key initiatives that the European Union has undertaken to propose a global pandemic treaty and uh, to help move that forward. So, uh, Mr. Michel, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this session, and we look forward to hearing the dimensions that the European Union wants to bring to this effort on collaborative intelligence and making the world safer. Please. Thank you, and good morning, everyone from Brussels. But first of all, let me uh, uh, thank you, my dear brother, Tedros, for organizing this panel. And congratulations to the WHO and Germany for making this intelligence hub a reality. And for me, it's an honor, it's also a pleasure to share this milestone, this important milestone with all of you today. Um, dear friends, just last week, we had our latest European Council meeting here in Brussels. And I have now chaired over 16 meetings where the 27 EU leaders have addressed COVID-19. And I can tell you one thing, in a time of a crisis, what we crucially need is credible data and up-to-date intelligence. And today I would like to address several topics with you. First, global governance for global solutions. Second, the lessons learned from our European response. And finally, the One Health approach needed more than ever. Ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 has killed nearly 5 million people around the world, 5 million people. And it has also revealed that no country, not even the most developed, was prepared for such a pandemic, despite the many predictions of scientists. And the virus exposed the gaps in our national preparedness but it has also exposed star deficiencies in global governance. Information sharing is a clear example of that. The virus has been brutal and unrelenting. It has surprised us at every turn, 
but it has also revealed that with the right tools for sharing treated information rapidly, we can save lives. And this means sharing data about how virus spreads, who are the most vulnerable, and what the best treatments are. And it's obvious, intensive international cooperation must play a critical role. When we cooperate with one another, when we trust one another, we can build common mechanisms and solutions at global, regional, and local level. And there is no doubt we must learn, we must implement new ways of working. And it's precisely for this reason that together with you, uh, Dr. Tedros, we have proposed an international treaty on pandemics rooted in the WHO constitution. And this idea is supported by heads of state and governments from many countries across the globe. But I know some are still reluctant and we will try to convince them. Because this treaty would establish clear rules and a clear framework for everyone. It would guarantee equity and inclusiveness. It would also ensure access to information, financing, vaccines, and countermeasures. It would increase capacity and resilience at all levels. A legally binding instrument would also be the most effective basis for an international system of prevention, surveillance, collection, and exchange of scientific data. Because data is critical to our decision making and it's crucial in developing safe and effective measures such as vaccines, medicines, or medical and protective equipment. And I'm convinced this intelligence hub will be an important step in bolstering our international cooperation. A clear demonstration of the benefits in setting up collaborative tools that work across sectors especially tools that involve both private and public stakeholders and operate on any continent. We need to create an environment where every scientist, health worker, government can bend together for a common cause. Working together to build new solutions to protect what's most precious, our health and our lives. And that's exactly what we want to achieve with this idea of an international treaty we will continue to advocate and encourage the global community to support it, including in a few days and the next G20 meeting in Rome. Ladies and gentlemen, now I want to share with you three things the EU learned in our response to COVID-19. First point, coordination is vital. In the EU, health is merely a national or even sometimes a regional competence. Yet early in the pandemic, we realized that information sharing needed to be strengthened, not only between countries, but also between services within national administrations. So one of our first actions to bolster coordination was to task our ministers to consult with each other on a daily basis. And as a result, they held video conferences every working day during the first month and then three times a week in the months that followed. And this was in addition to the heads of state and government meetings we held every two to three weeks. And we discovered that information at national level on infection rate, testing or hospital capacity was not enough to manage the crisis. And so we decided to task the European Center for Disease Control to start collecting and breaking down the data and also to make sure that our common data was based on the same common criteria. And this helped us to better anticipate the next phases of this pandemic. It also helped us to provide targeted assistance to areas that needed it most. It was also extremely useful in assessing whether to restrict or to open mobility for our citizens. It sounds simple, but this was no easy task when you consider the different national structures, agencies, practices, and ways of collecting information, not to mention all the different languages we have at the EU level. And this one 
of the challenges that the information hub will have to overcome on a much larger scale at global level. But it is worth the effort because credible data are invaluable. Second point, we learned the value of fact-based and objective decisions. And let me give you one example. Discussions on travel restrictions were extremely political and even controversial in the beginning of the crisis, especially since freedom of movement is a pillar of our European Union. And today, this has become a purely objective and scientific exercise, not only because we developed a common certificate, but because the European Center for Disease Control publishes all the information and citizens can have an overview of the COVID situation in their country and across the Union at the same time as national administrations. Third point, and probably the most important. We learned that solidarity is the gold standard in overcoming this pandemic. As the crisis progressed, we adapted and developed new solutions. In some cases, we were faster than others, in others, maybe slower. But we were always guided by the principle of EU solidarity and inclusiveness. We acted together. We had the same rule for everyone. And probably our joint procurement of vaccines is the most spectacular example of this EU solidarity. We shared the delivery of doses among our 27 member states. And today, more than 75% of adults in the EU are fully vaccinated, vaccinated. This is clearly a great achievement for the EU. Dear friends, we have learned many lessons from this pandemic. We continue to learn every day and to improve our response every day. We must continue to adapt to the pandemic as the situation evolves, and we will continue to do so until everyone is safe. But everyone is not yet safe, and this is not acceptable. The gap in vaccination rates between developed and developing countries must be solved quickly. And this means removing the obstacles that are hampering the global rollout of vaccines. First, we must export doses of vaccines. This is what we did from the very beginning and are still doing at EU level. Second point, financing COVAX is good, but it's not enough. And we must solve the current obstacles and bottlenecks. And third point, we must fulfill more quickly our commitments on vaccine donations. And finally, we have started with African governments, the European Investment Bank and private partners to develop fast track and concrete projects to increase vaccine manufacturing capacities. And I'm personally convinced that we must make this international solidarity much more operational and much more urgent. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to raise one final point. Until now, we have focused on the human side of health, and rightly so. But in the future, I hope we'll invest more in one health, the link between our environment, animal health, and human health. We cannot wait for a new virus to emerge. We must adapt our practices and our behavior with wild animals and nature. This will ensure that viruses and bacteria do not transfer from nature to humans. That is the key to prevention. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 has opened our eyes to our strengths and our weaknesses. And the European project is based on the principle of human dignity. We are convinced that global challenges like climate change, economic development, security, or the fight against pandemics require global solutions. We believe, we firmly believe in a rules-based international order. We firmly believe in universal values. And we sincerely hope the international community will negotiate and agree on the future international treaty on pandemics. Let's keep in mind the future of our children in the spirit of our predecessors 
who signed the UN Charter over 75 years ago. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Michel, for taking uh, the time to join us in person and uh, to speak so passionately about this ecosystem and uh, the role that a pandemic treaty as a set of rules within that ecosystem could play, but also to highlight the role of values as we build such an ecosystem. And you particularly highlighted collective action, which is a value also, not just something one does, solidarity and the inclusiveness. And that, of course, is absolutely central, as Dr. Tedros underlined, that no one is safe until everyone is safe and everyone needs to be included in this process. And the inclusiveness also of the WHO Hub and the other initiatives that are going to be presented here today uh, is a very, very important element of what we will be speaking about. So thank you very much again. And uh, we look forward also to the cooperation within this ecosystem and personally, I very much hope that the member states of the WHO at the end of November will take the decision to move forward with such a treaty. So we wish you good luck for the further negotiations, trying to convince some who are not yet of that opinion. Thank you very much, Mr. Michel. I now have the great pleasure to ask Dr. Thomas Steffen, uh, the State Secretary, State Secretary of Health from the German Federal Ministry of Health to speak to us, to underline some of the steps that Germany has taken. You have already heard yesterday and today that Germany is now uh, the main funder of the World Health Organization, the strongest funder, the first funder of the World Health Organization. It has supported the building of the WHO hub here in Berlin. But there are many other dimensions to this work. And uh, Dr. Stefan, uh, over to you to share this with us. Madam Chair, Mr. President, Mr. Director General, Mr. Minister, dear panel members, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen, on behalf of um, the German Health Minister, uh, Jens Spahn, um, and the federal government, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all uh, in Berlin. It's a pleasure to speak to you uh, this, uh, this uh, early morning on the global uh, ecosystem. Let me start by saying I very much like the picture just used by Dr. Tetros, that the virus is not respecting borders. It's moving very, very fast around the globe. But he said data can be even faster. And this is a real chance to build the future ecosystem. We have to make use of the data and the better analysis to build a better world in future times. And that is why I want to really make use of this opportunity to discuss with you uh, today also how Germany is contributing to the development of this global ecosystem for a pandemic and epidemic intelligence and also what others can do and how they can contribute. Indeed, we are still in the greatest global crisis since the last decades, but it lies in our hands to make this the last global health crisis of this kind of extent. We must make use of the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, and we have to learn from past mistakes. Namely, being very clear of what needs to be done differently and to use the short political window of opportunity for structural changes. And I may tell you from past crisis, there's always a very short window of opportunity and it will be closed quite soon. So let's use this kind of uh, window of opportunity. We all know through the various lessons learned and past panels, what needs to be done. We are not lacking knowledge. We now need political courage to move beyond comfort levels and implement lessons learned. COVID-19 has highlighted how interconnected and interdependent 
our lives are across countries. And to use another picture, that only a few decades ago, the 193 countries around the world had been sailing in 193 boats. But today, it's very, very clear we are living in one boat, and this is our interconnected uh, world. And that is why we have to fight such a crisis uh, together. Collaboration with international partners to approach questions of global health is now needed more than ever. Pandemic preparedness for the next future uh, emerging disease will need to build upon this interconnectivity. Therefore, improving global pandemic preparedness is a key priority also for Germany and not only, of course, for Germany. And that is why I would like to highlight very briefly four central points on how we all can contribute to the development of a global ecosystem for pandemic and epidemic intelligence. First, we fully support and we will continue to support the WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence here in Berlin. And I had the pleasure, I had the honor to um, meet um, Dr. Chikwe uh, three weeks ago to already discuss very first steps and how we can collaborate and closely work together, not only, but also with the German government and the future hub here in Berlin. The hub works to increase the availability of the key data, develop state-of-art analytic tools and predictive models for risk analysis. And the COVID-19 pandemic clearly showed that such innovative technologies are much needed to effectively prevent future uh, pandemics. I'm proud that the uh, Federal Ministry of Health here in Germany committed to fund the WHO hub with up to 30 million euros annually. With this support of the hub, we are uh, substantially improving and reshaping the global landscape for pandemic preparedness for a safer future. Second, we truly support the WHO and will continue to support the WHO in a very concrete terms as its main funder. We do this because we are convinced the world will remain unsafe from future emerging health threats unless the WHO is truly enabled or in other words, we can only guarantee global health security if we have a truly capable international organization that is able to lead and to coordinate not only global health uh, overall, but also pandemic preparedness and response. And this can only be the WHO. Also, the work and the mandate of other important global health actors like the Global Fund, Gavi, UNAIDS, UNFPA, but also possible new structures uh, that are currently being discussed, such as a financial intermediate fund for pandemic preparedness and response at the World Bank, they fundamentally depend on a strong leading role of the WHO. I'm very convinced about that. To ensure and to strengthen the WHO capabilities, we need to improve sustainable WHO financing. It seems unacceptable to me that the only truly multilateral organization that is supposed to be member state owned and driven is only funded by 16% through its membership fee and by 84% through individual donors. This is why we call upon member states to stand up and to commit to the WHO funding as well. Third, we work together with lower and middle income countries to strengthen structures of pandemic preparedness on site. We all know that the health crisis has rapidly put significant strain on fragile health systems and that rapid expert uh, deployment is crucial to ensure necessary countermeasures. The Federal Ministry of Health established the Global Health Protection Program. Through this program, we collaborate with international stakeholders to support the strengthening of health systems in fragile contexts. Within the five last year, 35 projects were set up to improve the impl implementation of the international health regulations, infection prevention, and the closure of knowledge gaps. The world can only be prepared for future pandemics 
if the health system of all countries are resilient to disease uh, outbreaks. This is why we call upon other governments to engage in health system strengthening worldwide as well. And lastly, Germany is in favor of a pandemic treaty. And we just heard from the uh, president how important it is for others uh, to join the discussion and to support the discussion. We are in favor of a pandemic treaty to improve pandemic and epidemic intelligence. The treaty has been recommended by practically all lesson learned panels. It would complement the possibly reformed international health regulations to ensure national and global resilience against future pandemics. The concrete details of the treaty are under negotiation right now, but I'm hopeful that we will soon be able to find sustainable results together. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all in this together. We need a global ecosystem for pandemic and epidemic intelligence and an ecosystem for preparedness and response. We invite all countries and call on other partners all over the world to work together and to also contribute to the global hub, the WHO hub here in Berlin. Let's work on together on this new global data ecosystem. And I may add by reminding all of us that the year 2020, to use an expression by the British Queen, was really an annus horribilis. By joining forces, we can make a real difference for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Stefan, and thank you for reminding us of that window of opportunity and that we must not let it pass. Uh, and uh, we must make the most of it. So it's my pleasure to thank uh, both Dr. Tedros, uh, Mr. Michel, and Dr. Stefan. And uh, you are welcome to leave the podium now. Uh, and uh, we will hear uh, from the next round of speakers. Thank you very, very much for joining us here. Thank you, Mr. Michel. Thank you very much uh, to our opening speakers. Uh, the next speaker will be Dr. Chikwe Ihekriazu, that has been mentioned several times. But before I introduce him, I just want to share three pictures with you, three slides of uh, the opening of the hub. You see here this uh, call on collaborative intelligence to keep the world safe and an attempt to also capture that visually, how many different points of data, of information, of infrastructure, of people working, of disciplines can come together uh, to keep the world safe. We heard that uh, Dr. Merkel, Dr. Angela Merkel had uh, opened the hub and uh, you can see here a photograph of it. If you wonder uh, what this means, uh, it is because uh, the building into which uh, the hub will be moving is still under construction. And uh, so that was taken as a motto and a ribbon was cut in a sort of quasi uh, construction site. Uh, but it's also symbolic that uh, this is something new we are constructing in terms of collective action and of coming together. And on this occasion, WHO also gave a special medal to the Chancellor uh, for her uh, support to the World Health Organization over the years. And the last picture I want to share with you is uh, from the panel. Uh, you see, we had a panel of uh, experts from around the world to actually share knowledge with us uh, we have heard from Dr. Tedros the need to perhaps take CERN as a model uh, of having a big vision and moving forward to implement that together. So the director of CERN was with us. We spoke about the enormous need uh, for scientific innovation uh, that is required and Catalin Carico who played a key role in the development of uh, the vaccines uh, 
before COVID-19 uh, was with us. And finally, we also highlighted one of the dimensions that Mr. Michel also referred to, the link between the environment and uh, environmental research and uh, global health and had uh, the first and I think so far one and only uh, German professor from the Potsdam Institute who um, uh, is jointly a professor of environment and uh, global health. And you see one lone gentleman uh, on uh, that panel. And uh, this is Dr. Chikwe Ihekwiazu, uh, who will speak to us now, uh, giving us his vision of uh, the WHO hub on uh, pandemic and epidemic intelligence. And we also have with us, who has uh, just joined us, Drudesha Madhub uh, from Mauritius. Uh, she's the Data Protection Commissioner and from the Mauritius Data Protection Office. But first, uh, Chikwe, if you would join us and uh, share with us your vision of the hub. He, Dr. Tedros has already introduced Chikwe. Uh, just about still, I think you are the director of the Nigerian Center of Disease Control. And from the 1st of November, Chikwe will be the Assistant Director General for Emergency Health Intelligence at the WHO and the director of the WHO Hub. Please, over to you, Chikwe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ilona. And thanks uh, for your team for inviting me, uh, acknowledging the presence of my uh, Honorable Minister of Health from Nigeria, Dr. Osage Hanire, and of course, the DG of the WHO. Um, where to start? Um, DG Tedros just said that we need a new we need new powerful systems and tools for global surveillance to collect, analyze, and act for us to be better prepared and to act on threats of epidemic and pandemic potential. And that we need to do this not alone but collectively by bringing together scientists, innovators, policymakers, social scientists from around the world. Um, this really is a bold assertion, and uh, one that recognizes that the old rigid siloed hierarchical approaches of the past are no longer sufficient, but is also a very, very difficult task. As being asked to do something, we are being literally asked to do something that has never been done before. To be honest, over until a few days ago, Ilona, I left the job on the 18th of this month. I was part, very much part of that old system. And in all the positions I've held in the last 20 years, working in national public health institutes, we have used that old system to work. We've reported data on specific days from specific levels by specific people up specific channels and almost never downwards. I specifically remember a few days after I was appointed as DG of NCC five years ago, we were on the verge of elimination of the wild poliovirus in Nigeria. Then sadly, we had four new cases reported in Bruno in Northeast Nigeria a security compromised part of our country. And you can imagine how devastated we were. We started a response, uh, everyone mobilized locally, globally. And two months into the response, I was reminded that I hadn't officially informed WHO. So we then had to officially put down a report to take that report upwards in the traditional way ignoring the fact that the response was well on the way, actually supported by WHO, and everything needed had already started. But in a way, we couldn't officially say we're in response mode because we hadn't taken the official channels upwards. So leading a National Public Health Institute in the last five years in Africa's most populous country has led to a lot of clarity in my understanding of the strengths of surveillance as is practiced at the moment, but also its limitations as it is currently defined. 
and the incredible opportunities there are to improve. So many people have asked whether this new home will, this, will be this new supercomputer center in Berlin that will suck in all the data from around the world and produce magical res results. An approach like this is obviously doomed to fail. We must build, yes, from the top down, but we must also build from the bottom up. So where are we today? Truth is that we're really not starting from zero. Over the last years, we've invested a lot of time and effort in building new data collection uh, systems. Almost every country, including the one I've worked in, have built new systems in Nigeria together with the Helmholtz Institute here in Germany. We've together built a new digital surveillance system called SOMAS. And I know from many of our colleagues across many countries that almost every country, especially during this uh, pandemic, has innovated around new systems. So we all agree and understand that there's a deficit in many of our countries and we're working in small pockets to solve this. Now, what have we learned from the pandemic? What we have learned is that many of the most of the work that we're doing is done in small silos in our countries and on what we call data islands, on shared between countries and very often on shared within countries. So we need new types of information from outside the health sector too, to understand what is happening within the health sector. Imagine how our understanding of the pandemic and its spread would have been helped if we had easy access to travel patterns. But travel patterns are not the only thing. We need to better understand water systems, weather systems, animal movements, and so much more. And we know that a lot of work is going into this and has gone into this in the past, but not in a way that it's directly relevant for the health sector, the health of the world, because it's not being collected, analyzed, and looked into consistently from a global level. But we also think, we also know that better data alone will not lead to better decisions, better political decisions, but we have a responsibility to offer our decision makers the best possibility that they can to make those better decisions. So what are the opportunities today? There is really an explosion of technical capabilities in data systems, in the analysis thereof. We have seen this work and evolve in so many other sectors, in physics, engineering, and social media, in election forecasting, and many more. On the, one of the many exciting features of this pandemic is the use of non-traditional uh, methods in global health surveillance and analytics. Now, what are we trying to do at the hub is to really strategically work towards bringing all of this together. And by WHO leading on the development of this hub, it shows that WHO recognizes the need and opportunities and is ready and willing to work with others to achieve this. How will we achieve this? Our goal is really to strengthen pandemic and epidemic intelligence through better data, better analytics, and better decisions by creating a physical and a virtual space where we can work together, bringing together the many new institutions that are thinking in the same direction. So this is by no means an exclusive task. We want to actively collaborate with many colleagues, many of whom will share the stage in a few minutes that are thinking in the same direction. The scale of the challenge makes it unlikely that any one information system can solve all our problems. The world is way too complex for that approach. This is why our approach embraces this multiplicity from the very beginning, to facilitate, facilitate different information systems to work together without asking countries to choose one or the other. To work more effectively, we're taking an approach that we'll call collaborative intelligence with, that will build from the beginning on a multi-stakeholder and multi-sectoral approach uh, based on what we're calling a trust architecture. Building that trust architecture will very much depend on how we relate to others from the very beginning. I understand that when we say this, it is surprising and confusing for many people because we're used to being offered single big solutions to all our problems in global health. 
This time we're asking for time and trust to enable us to think with you on something that we all know we need to do, but defining it in detail right now is simply not possible as we will fall into exactly the same trap that we have all, all very often fallen into in the past. So to, so to conclude, we hope that we'll be able to build systems where, with which we can generate the speed and the capability to detect and understand new public health risks whenever they occur in the world, but that WHO will not be doing it for the world, but we will be doing it with the world. All of this will require a new global data system, ec ecosystem that enables insights from public health data being shared more freely and more quickly, integrating context and shared in a way that strengthens our collaborative decision making. Mission impossible, maybe, but I'm really excited to work with you to achieve this over the next few years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chikwe, and you're very welcome to uh, stay with me so that I'm not so alone up here on the podium. Uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, ask Rudesha Madhu, who I've already introduced, uh, to give some comments, particularly uh, Drudesha, on this last point that uh, Chikwe referred to, the information ecosystem, the ability to share data and insights as freely as possible. Could you share some of your uh, experiences and also some of the challenges that are faced if one wants to go in that direction? Please, uh, Drudesha, over to you. Thank you, Ilona, and I'm very pleased to be with you today. It's indeed a privilege to be discussing and on such an important issue. And definitely not, not really mission impossible, like Chikwe referred to, will make that mission impossible possible. And I think it's very important to, to welcome first the, the launch of the WHO hub, and also the very exciting idea about having an international treaty, which will encompass all the aspects that we are talking about today, especially the uh, global information ecosystem, how it's going to be made, what are the foundational principles, what are going to be the safeguards that we're going to put into place to protect people's data. And definitely, as you know, data is the key word, if not the only important aspect in the whole debate that we are talking today. As rightly pointed out by Dr. Tidris, it's moving very fast. And if we don't accompany the, the speed and the fastness with which data is really traveling across frontiers, then we might lose this battle. But uh, I would like to throw certain, certain questions because for me, before we move on to solutions, it's very important to understand what we are talking about, sorry. <clears throat> My own terminology, you know, I view COVID-19 as a weapon of mass destruction. But for me, it has muted today now into a weapon of mass surveillance. Why I'm saying it, because I believe that it used to be the case that you know, state emergency and uh, global health emergency crisis has, you know, we, we started using data on a level which was unprecedented. And maybe many a times we didn't have, as governments, the time to care for the data that we're using because we needed it for other prevailing health interests. So we neglected many important aspects, including human rights. Let, let me just uh, uh, relate you to what the uh, UN personal data protection and privacy principles say, that we should be accompanying human rights together in this uh, pandemic. That is, we should not trump over human rights as far as we can. So if we believe that this is indeed the case, then the time has come for us to ask these questions that I'm going to, to put here. Um, my own analogy, uh, analysis, sorry, how far, you know, technology and what we're calling to do today as techno solutionism and datafication of health 
has really controlled, you know, um, helped in controlling the virus. This is my first and foremost question. Second question, what mechanisms have proven up to now to be more harmful to human rights and less effective in saving lives? The current mechanisms in place. And has that really impacted or reinforced health inequity and power asymmetries or the contrary? We must not also forget Third point, the public health interest in sharing health and biometric data. We do acknowledge this. This is the prime consideration for all governments. There is indeed public interest involved, but it should not undermine the interest of protecting such data, which is of a highly sensitive data. As you know, in data protection jargon, health and biometric data are considered special categories of data, right? So what have we done up to now to protect this particular interest? This is also public interest, right? And what long-term care measures in terms of data stewardship management practices have we foreseen is going to come with the global information ecosystem? that we need long-term solutions and not only short-term solutions. And lastly, the last question that I will be saying, what is the time frame that has been earmarked for the application of health emergency measures? Are we going to be permanently in emergency? This is not going to be the case. So what mechanism, mechanism sorry, is in place to review the duration of measures which can severely impact privacy, for example, one among so many human rights. And these are the questions I wanted to, to put. And now please allow me to give you some solutions accordingly with regard to the questions that have been put from a data protection perspective. All data protection authorities across the world agree and are really militating for some nine principles. Privacy by design and default. For example, in the design of health passports, we have so many designs of health passports across the world, except for the EU, which has a harmonized approach, which is very good. But we have so many other designs across the world. And how do we ensure, how does WHO ensure that there is a formal and comprehensive, let's say privacy impact assessment of all these health passports and other related, you know, technologies that are being used to ensure that privacy and other human rights are incorporated, are embedded or ingrained in these designs. Data minimization, very um, currently topical. We know that excessive data is being collected across in relation to health, but not necessarily health centered. So how do we ensure that, you know, only the data required is being collected and only the data that is being required is being shared. Retention limitation, as I said, time is of essence. We cannot take emergency measures for very prolonged periods of time because we are also jeopardizing other aspects of human lives. Purpose specification, definitely. This is where score creep you know, and other functions creep are happening. That is, if we do not know for what purpose we are collecting that data, that health data, definitely there will be abuses and there have been. Necessity, proportionality, lawful basis, fairness, accuracy, data security, integrity, confidentiality, openness. They will have all of these principles to be incorporated in the global ecosystem information and data sharing. So it's very important that we consider all of them. I know I won't be able to cover all of these aspects, but I will definitely be coming back to what I believe the next or the future WHO should be, if you allow me during the concluding remarks. So I will stop here because I'm very mindful of time. And thank you, Ilona. If you have any other questions, please uh, uh, let me know. Thank you.
thank you very much, Rajesha, and thank you for highlighting very, very key principles of data stewardship, of underlining that any such ecosystem uh, must be uh, based on human rights, and also drawing our attention again to power asymmetries that uh, one will need to address in a variety of ways, not only between countries, but also between groups, and uh, particularly the situation of vulnerable groups. If we look right now, uh, for example, at the migration movements in relation to COVID-19 and data collection, that has become a very, very important issue. Uh, we will now expand our panel. Uh, so I would very much like uh, Dr. Rick Bright from the Rockefeller Foundation and Dr. Jeremy Farrar uh, from the Wellcome Trust to please uh, uh, come up here and, uh, and join us. You are very welcome. Thank you. Hello. So we have here two further architects, if I might call you that, uh, uh, of uh, this new uh, global ecosystem that we are trying to develop for pandemic and epidemic intelligence. And first, Rick, I'd like to ask you, uh, as the architect, what's it going to look like? You know, more like a Gary building or uh, <laughs> uh, something else. But anyhow, you're in the middle of uh, or at the beginning of building a pandemic prevention institute. Uh, you've been thinking about this for a long time. You've heard from the others what the WHO hub is trying to do, what the principles are that one should align with if one moves in that direction. Would you share just a bit of what your goals are and uh, what this institute looks like? Yes, good morning. And I'm very grateful for Director General Dr. Tedros and the World Health Summit Committee for the opportunity to join this important discussion today and for putting this topic front and center today because it's so critical that we get this right. I mean, it's no surprise, make no doubt that you have a very capable panel here, distinguished people, from distinguished organizations have a history of collaborating, working together, rising to a challenge to tackle things that have never been tackled before, that we need to really improve our capabilities to accomplish our goal. And it also goes without saying that we all know that the world has been dealt such a traumatic blow over the last couple of years to our economies, to our public health, to our livelihoods and lives and, and, and education. Um, ways that we will never be able to fully enumerate. And however, in the context, we've also seen remarkable advancements in medical countermeasures, vaccines and drugs and, and, and diagnostics, et cetera. And we need to make sure that we're working together collaboratively to get those things to work where they need to be equitably to, as Dr. Tedro said last night, end this pandemic now. We also need to make sure that we're doing everything within our power to make sure this never happens again. Never again is our goal. One year ago at the World Health Summit, Dr. Rajiv Shah, who's the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, made a commitment to doing everything that the Rockefeller Foundation could do to bring in their expertise, their legacy of working together collaboratively bringing science to public health and technology to make sure that we could end this pandemic, recover from it, and do all we could to make sure it doesn't happen again. And the consequence of that, or part of that commitment, is the launching of what we call the Pandemic Prevention Institute. The Institute is a collaborative organization that is focused on bringing the latest scientific achievements and data analytics, and partnerships to support and strengthen our global surveillance ecosystem, as we've heard a lot about today. We're already getting started on this. So we're leveraging diverse sectors, expertise from the financial marketplace, expertise from other areas of physics and engineering and knowledge to number one, bring a new way of thinking to the data that we have. The world is full of data, but it's fragmented, it's isolated, siloed, and we tend to think of it in different pockets and think of it differently. So we believe one of the greatest values we can bring to this 
discussion to this solution is to convene different experts to think differently and bring that mindset into the Pandemic Prevention Institute so we can marry it with the other efforts, with the, the Berlin Hub, the UK Radar System, and other tremendous organizations. And we can collaborate with this new knowledge, this new data, these new ways of analyzing information to make the information we have today smarter. In surveillance, we have today more um, layered with more complexity uh, and make it smarter. But then very importantly, to translate it so it is usable and understandable by more people in more places. We want to build what we call the local knowledge economy. So it doesn't do us any good if the data and information are held by major entities or governments. We want to make sure we can democratize the information, the insights gleaned from this new way of looking at data so it's not a population anywhere in the world waiting for a government to tell them what to do or to interpret that data or information. We want to be able to simplify the information so individuals can be empowered to make their own judgments and make their own decisions on how to protect their family, their community, while we're contributing to and working with the governments to make those policies. And very importantly, we have to have a sense of urgency. We have to act now. This cannot be an academic exercise. So the Pandemic Prevention Institute is off and running, um, partnering, collaborating, very engaged with the WHO and, and setting up the WHO hub here in Berlin, very engaged with other partners, setting up other entities. So we can make sure that we're not all looking or chasing the same shiny object you know, not duplicating efforts. We have to work together collaboratively to get this done, identifying our strengths, and then feeding that into this global ecosystem that Dr. Tedros and others have described so elegantly. I believe by working together, by bringing this new way of, of thinking and data science to the table, that it is a foundation for a strengthened surveillance system that it is a foundation that will allow us to see signals sooner, to speed the response and to stop an outbreak. I believe we can prevent pandemics by working together. Thank you very much, Rick. Thank you for those uh, first informations about uh, the Institute. Uh, Jeremy, can you uh, complement that through uh, the uh, goals of the International Pathic and Surveillance Network, Pandemic Radar, uh, and to highlight the dimensions that are particularly important there and how they contribute to the ecosystem. Yeah, thanks. No, no. I hope you can um, hear me. I, I think we, on that particular point, I think we need to, these are all the same. If, if we see what Tedros described, what, uh, what Tedros described earlier, what Chikwe described now and, and, and Rick and what came out of the G7 through the UK presidency, as a series of separate entities, then we're just going back to another fragmented world order and, and, and that won't help anybody. So, so I, I think our job, all of our jobs, whoever's involved in all of this is gonna have to work really hard in the next um, days, weeks and months to bring all of these things, things together. But perhaps I could just step back a little before going into that particular question that we've got to remind ourselves the pandemic is not over. It's a long way from being over. Um, I've just come in last night from, from the UK. UK has an incredibly high vaccination uptake. It has one in 55 people at the moment infected in its current wave. That is a staggering thing to say. And if vaccination was not available in the UK, the National Health Service would have fallen over by now. And the truth is that is what is happening around the world. So much as many of us and are thinking of what comes next, we cannot lose sight of the fact that although sitting in Berlin or in London or Geneva or Washington, things look quite good. The reality is the pandemic is very far from, from over. And the inequality that is still bedeviling the world is a scar on humanity, uh, which if we don't put that into the heart of what we think about next, 
whether it's surveillance or research and development, manufacturing, distribution of the tools required for this and future pandemics, then we will have learned um, nothing. And we are truly in a, a pandemic era. If you, in my view, if you look at the great drivers of the 21st century, whether they be uh, land use change, environment change, climate change, urbanization, trade and travel, these are all drivers which are essentially the drivers of the epidemics and pandemics we've had over the last 20 years, and we've had plenty of warnings. And in the last 20 years, we've had a series of disruptive regional or national events, now global events, and we haven't heeded the warning. And the comment earlier that the window of opportunity to change is very short is, I'm afraid, a stark truth. Every single epidemic I've been involved in over the last 20 years, people have said this time is different. And frankly, it never has been. And if now we don't make the changes that are required in the short window of political opportunity, we will never, ever make them. And whilst the Rockefeller is doing remarkable things, and I hope Welcome is doing things and other philanthropy is doing things, the reality is philanthropy can catalyze it can take risk where others don't take risk, but essentially this is a political issue. And it, if it doesn't get resolved politically, then philanthropy will only be able to add to what's being done. It can't solve the problems. And so we have to have political statements, whether that's a treaty, whether it's the G7, the G20, the United Nations, and ultimately that has to come through the centerpiece, which is the World Health Organization. And we have to make those reforms quickly if we're going to make any, any movement forward. And my major concern is that at a time when it's been very challenging for any country to deal with its domestic issues at the same time as appreciate its international responsibilities, that is the new world. That is the world of the 21st century where you are going to face tremendous domestic pressures at the same time as having international responsibilities. And governments are pulled in opposite directions. We have to solve this issue and we have to bring the world's nations together, um, ultimately through a legitimate body. I think it and I have to be through the United Nations and then technically through the delivery of the World Health Organization. We have to build greater resilience over efficiency. And the final point I make to learn, whatever surveillance we put in place, it has to be local. It has to be grounded in public health, in the animal sector, the agricultural sector, in clinical practice, and it has to be locally responsive. And it then has to link up with the research and development that can go on so that we have the tools, whether it be oxygen or PPE or vaccines or diagnostics or therapeutics, whatever is required. But surveillance on itself can easily become stamp collecting unless it's linked to the rest of the activities. And somehow we've got to bridge this um, public health, clinical and research communities, all of which are fragmented and separated and have their own drivers, their own incentives and their own, uh, their own career structures and everything else. And the final thing I'm going to say, do not build things just for epidemics. People today will say they'll support epidemic work forever. They won't. It has to be grounded in things that bring utility every day to everybody. And if they're not, then you won't attract good people, which is the crux of this. And over time, if there isn't an epidemic in your country, inevitably the funding and the people will drift away. So whatever surveillance, whatever data is gathered, whatever infrastructure is put in place, please make sure that it is integrated into public health and clinical medicine and that it is providing utility all of the time rather than just for occasional dreadful epidemics and pandemics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And you saw how much that also resonated uh, with the audience and picking up also on this issue that this must be the time when we also strengthen health systems and particularly public health infrastructures and uh, at last that discussion has also begun, but also uh, reflecting back on the local level and uh, what uh, was also uh, mentioned earlier, the issue around the power asymmetry of, you know, who is taking the initiatives, who benefits from the initiatives and other such issues. And I'd like to get back to you, Chikwe, if you could comment on that. 
because initially, uh, you know, people could say, well, you know, here they're doing this at Rockefeller over there and in, the, at in London and in Berlin. Uh, what do we really have from it? You know, what, what is that goal and how does that also reflect in how the hub wants to approach things? Unless we do this with the countries of the global south and help them build their systems, I guess uh, we only increase the power symmetry. Thanks, Ilona. I think there's very often an assumption that nothing is happening in the global south. And, and that really is not the case. That there's, and that definitely hasn't been my experience. So when I, when I talk about, um, let me use a real example, the SOMAS example I used earlier. Yes, the, some of the, the ideas and the initiation came from colleagues in Germany, but we have a group of developers now at NCC that are working on that solution every day. These are young people mostly um, that we've brought in to adapt that and to fix and solve and react to challenges that we have in our own uh, space and through that if you look at um, if you look at the the website that we build the information sharing so there's a lot of work that has happened locally that has been driven by uh, by Nigerians that have developed that space and if you look at uh, a lot of the innovation that has happened in other parts outside of health in fintech in uh, in telecoms um, in banking, a lot of the innovation that came to the West many years after started on the continent because the needs were more stark there. The need to move to global currencies and things like that started outside, started in contexts where you wouldn't normally ex expect that to happen. The, the challenge that we've had, I think, in many of our countries is that we haven't been able to attract the best minds into the public sector in many of our countries. At NCDC where I've worked, we had the benefit of being a fairly young organization. And so we had that opportunity uh, to some extent. So we need to do a lot more of that and start really working uh, with colleagues. But I, I want to really say that it's, it's not that um, colleagues, the human resources don't exist. What I'm very keen for us to leverage on is actually leverage on the the, the what the uh, global philanthropy will bring and make but make sure that we are prepared to to work work with them and make sure that we benefit from them when i say we i'm talking about now in terms of our broader responsibilities to the world and and pick up a lot of the small innovative approaches that have uh, evolved organically give them opportunity of scale opportunity of uh, global integration and local utility. Because, you know, like Jeremy so articulately uh, say, that there's, we can't build this from the top down. It's, it's impossible. I mean, people will li literally walk away before you even, before they have the opportunity of, of, of seeing the benefits or not of whatever solutions we offer. And, and even in our context, Nigeria is a big country. Um, <laughs> the, what we do at the federal level, we still have to sell it to colleagues at the state and local level. We have 36 states, none of whom I can give in my, an order in my previous job to do one, two, three. I have to convince them of the benefit to them and to the clinicians and uh, researchers working in their context and convince them to work with us. Uh, the fact that we're doing sequencing uh, today in Nigeria is not because we built it in a national public health institute. It's the fact that it was done by researchers primarily in an academic setting. And now we have convinced them to come and work with us. They see the benefit of having the, uh, the see the benefit of having the National Public Health Institute's a stamp on the work that they've done. So they're very keen to get uh, that credit. And, but it's how do we build those alliances in a more a global world? So I, I think we're in an exciting time moving forward, a, a time where there's no solution that anyone can offer from north, south, east, or west. That's the way this, is, this can and should be done. And so for once, we have an opportunity to really learn together. And I hope that we will have the humility as well uh, to translate that opportunity in, into reality. Thank you. Uh, can I ask if Judesha is still with us? 
I can't see her here on uh, yes. the... Yes, I am. You? Yes, Ilona, yes. yes oh, Ilona. that's good to hear. Could you also comment on this, Trudesha? You had also been speaking about the power of symmetries. And uh, if you look at uh, this development of an ecosystem from Mauritius, uh, what is it that you would say? And uh, particularly, as Chikwe has highlighted, we need to take a different mind frame here. It's not, you know, that there's a wide open... Uh, empty space in low and middle income countries. There's much innovation, there's much will to act, but there are problems. What would uh, your uh, answer be here? Yes, Alona, I think we have to appreciate that COVID just came to accentuate the problems already on ground. We already had so many weaknesses um, in our governments, in our country structure, in, in data management. We already had so many problems. It's only like we have aggravated the situation with COVID. Um, for me, uh, if, you, if you want to hear from me, what I believe hierarchy should be here to really reduce these power uh, you know, inequities. To start with, we have the people at the end, and then we come with our governments, and then we come with regional uh, organizations, and then international organizations. And why I would say now that the WHO in this particular context is the most important uh, international forum that we should look up to because the role of the WHO has changed from what it used to be uh, a, a, an advisory uh, role to a more strengthened role of, let's say more you know, prominent role and of intervention in national governments. And this is the time for WHO to be able to really, you know, grab this opportunity and make convince our governments that we need really to have this coordinated approach. And also at the level of international organizations now, we need to also have a coordinated approach with all international and regional organizations and which will impact on coordination at the level of government. Um, we all know that Africa is a different context. Asia Pacific is another one, and the other continents are all different. And we can never harmonize all of them. And that is not a possibility. So if there's something that pe people and countries should look up to, and that is the WHO. So we need to rethink the strategies and the main roles and functions of WHO, because here, if the pandemic is going to survive, let's say for four to five years more, then the only organization and the only concern that the world will be having is health and health data. So which is the organization which is going to make that difference? Obviously it can only be WHO. Thanks, Ilona. Thank you, Judesha. And that of course also takes us back to the treaty and the responsibility of the member states. Uh, to actually take things forward. And some of us have been a little bit discouraged about uh, the willingness of member states to move forward and support their organization, both politically and financially. Uh, Rick, I'd like to get back to you because uh, we're talking about many different stakeholders. Jeremy has underlined just how political this area is. Also, you know, data are political, who collects them, who has access to them, everything else with that. And I'd like to speak to you now in terms of being a foundation, being the Rockefeller Foundation that also has a very long history, for example, of working in China. And uh, therefore, could you share with us as you're building this prevention institute, how uh, Rockefeller as a foundation can actually work and discuss and move things forward together with stakeholders in other countries, even if you know, the countries themselves are not on the best of terms at that point in time? Yeah, thank you. No, it's really important. It's all about relationships. It's about trust and building the trust. And, um, you know, is some countries that are really important to reach and I honestly do not think we can have an effective global surveillance or intelligence system if we don't include all countries. That includes China is a very important country, Russia and others are very important countries to include 
in a surveillance system. And um, we will always have nations at odds with each other. Um, in history, I think we have proven that and I'm certain that will be the future. Therefore, it is also important that we build a parallel level of trust uh, and communication and silent scientific diplomacy um, within countries and uh, between the scientists within the country. We see this happening already. We have global databases now, such as the GISA database, where scientists from over 194 countries and territories are sharing information freely, willingly, and the rest of the world is partaking of that information. So even while governments might have um, struggles or challenges with each other and working together and challenges building trust, um, scientists are much more effective at it. And another important player is not a, a country or political player, but we have to bring the private sector to this as well. And that's another unique thing that the Rockefeller Foundation can do is not just bring together different countries, but bring together different sectors. I think for too long, we have kept the private sector out of surveillance, out of public health. There's a firewall. And I have learned in my previous role, the value of working with the private sector and bridging public private sectors to get the best of both worlds and finding that interface. Because again, no one sector and no one country can do this alone. And the sooner we find the ability to collaborate and build that trust and leverage each other and share this in a transparent way around the world, the more effective and sooner we will have this global intelligence system. Thank you, Rick. And thank you for underlining this notion of trust uh, in its uh, very, very different dimensions. And probably next year at the World Health Summit discussing, you know, trust architecture and discussing the role of new stakeholders in public health could be a very interesting challenge to have some really open discussions about that. We've more or less reached the end of our panel, but I do want to uh, give uh, Jeremy the chance for a wish. Jeremy, we heard of the important role that uh, Germany is playing, has played for global health and for the WHO. Germany is taking on the G7 presidency. So uh, Christmas is coming soon. Uh, so uh, what is your wish? Uh, if uh, you know the new German chancellor were to come to you and say, what are the two key issues in relation to this pandemic, to the future, to a, uh, a century that is defined by risk, uh, what would you ask of him? It will be a he. Will it be a he? It will be a he. <laughs> I thought about that. <laughs> okay, so um, it's almost my birthday, so I'm going to have two. What, one is don't move on before this is finished. Finish the job and do it in an equitable way. And then the second one is, and I think very important when it takes over G7, it gives it a, a, a platform, if you like. We, the, parts of the world are at loggerheads at the moment, and there will be very difficult to bring the world together unless we get some sort of political movement. And I think Germany in particular, Europe in more general, has got a capacity to bring the world back together again to address all the great challenges of the 21st century. So that's a tall order for the G7 presidency. Um, but I think unless we do that, scientists can do what Rick did, said, absolutely agree with you. But in the end, it's about politics. And at the moment, the politics is too fragmented and too polarized. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to our speakers right at the beginning. Dr. Tedros is still here with us. And uh, a very important message at the end. And I think a message for each and every one of us. Uh, to also bring that message to the politicians, to the people who represent us, and to move it forward. And to say, you know, finish the job, don't go into this uh, cycle of panic and neglect, as we have called it in the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, but stay focused and uh, move things forward, but move them forward in new ways, in new partnerships, and with new kinds of ideas that really prove to be sustainable. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to you for coming and uh, have an excellent rest of the World Health Summit. Thank you. Thank you.